We are back. Welcome to Undermine Season 4, Episode Number 9. Number 9. Number 9. Is that a reference to something from 1994? It is. And oh, well, whatever. Never mind. I'm Tom Marshall, and I will be your tour guide, your fish tour guide, as we continue to set the flux capacitor for stops along Fish 1.0 history, a.k.a. the 1990s. We are on an abbreviated journey to Fall 97 when fish destroyed America. When we get there, we'll be discussing every Fall 97 show on its anniversary. In the meantime, you can catch new episodes of Undermine every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'm going to call out some listeners for a change. Lily, you're on the Bradley Beach Boardwalk right now, I'm guessing. Linda Lawrence, hello. You're up in Albany. Susanna Short, you're the surprise listener. I never knew you were keeping up with Undermine. Thank you. You're in northern New Jersey on your way to or from New York City. David Waxman. Thanks, brother. You're in the hard rock in Atlantic City. God knows why. Thanks to all of you. I'll call out more people at a later date. Meanwhile, my co-host for today's episode is fellow Undermine executive producer and New York Times bestselling author, Benji Eisen. Hi, Benji. Hi, Tom. So uh, this is it. We've arrived at the, the bomb factory. We're here. Yeah. I remember, I distinctly remember reading the fish.net reviews of this show the morning after uh, on May 8th, 1994 via Rec Music Fish. I'd have to go down to my computer lab to log on. I had a computer in my dorm, but of course, uh, you know, we were, because it's 1994, it wasn't hooked up to the internet. I would go down to the computer lab and by the morning before my first class, this show already achieved instant legend status and it was already nicknamed the tweezer fest you know nowadays we hear that term tweezer fest being slung around and brandied about every single time that the band weaves in and out of tweezer throughout mm -hmm. the set uh for example some big ones were Meriwether on uh, july 27th 2014 the philly met which uh, was from fall 2019 or December 2019. And more recently, even another Philly Tweezer set, the Man Music Center from July 19th this past summer. This summer, yep. Um, and I think I was, at, I was at all of those, actually. Another one is that, by the way, before anybody taunts or trolls us on Twitter for a glaring omission, let me preemptively establish that the July 31st, 2013 Tahoe <laughs> Tweezer gets its own nickname, the Tahoe Tweezer. <laughs> and it wasn't a fest. It was one long, thrilling epic. But on this night at the Bomb Factory, this was the OG Tweezer Fest. And in my mind, it's still synonymous with the nickname. If you say Tweezer Fest, you must be talking about the Bomb Factory or else you don't know what you're talking about. We're going to talk today to someone who does know what they are talking about because they had boots on the ground. They were there, I think, with a DAT machine in their hand. Nice. And I have to say, Tom, you know, I'm really looking forward to this one because I have been waiting 10,381 days to hear a firsthand account of what it was like to actually be in the room that night. But first, let's get this out of the way. If you've been enjoying this season of Undermine, then please consider upgrading by subscribing to Osiris Premium via Apple, where you'll get ad-free podcasts, bonus episodes, and apparently more. Okay, Tom, before one of us makes a bomb reference that gets all of our names on a file somewhere, <laughs> tell us about our guest. You're already on several files, Benji. Um, <laughs> but our guest today, I'm pleased to announce, very pleased to announce, is Dean Budnick, editor-in-chief at Relics Magazine, author and co-author of several books, including a new one about jam band impresario Peter Shapiro called The Music Never Stopped in which Benji, you're mentioned somewhere, I understand. Um, Dean also had his own fish podcast, Long May They Run, which ran for one season, but it's still essential listening for fish fans. And before he was a guest on the last season of Undermine, he actually appeared on Last Week Tonight with John Oliver in an episode about Ticketmaster. I'm going to let him out of the waiting room right now. Welcome back to Undermine, Dean Budnick. Let's see if he appears without further ado. That worked. Hi, Dean. How are you, how are you doing, man? Okay, okay. How about the two of you? <laughs> we are super. We're great. 
Um, I'm going to dive right in, right in with questions, um, because we have a bunch. This show is uh, important in many ways. Well, in one way, certainly. Um, but you were at this show, which is uh, Phil's me and Benji with great pleasure for if you've been following uh, this season, you'll know why. Um, but please give us some context since you know, since we know that you live in the Northeast and what were you doing in Texas on 5794? I was going to see fish. I mean, so to set it, I have this, I was curious about this. And so I have, um, I went back and looked at the original Schweiss to, to just to remind myself how this all went down. Right. So this first, the first Schweiss comes out and this is right before the band released hoist. So the new album, and, and, and let me just say this first of all. So uh, fish stops playing at the, the end of the summer of 93, they go away, they work on the album they play four shows, uh, a New Year's Eve run. Uh, I love the 1230 show, parenthetically. I think that's an underrated show. Uh, yeah. And then they come back. So they hadn't played for a while. So I was hankering to see some fish. And they initially announced these dates. By the way, they, they, you know, they added the secret Flynn date with the horns on April 4th, which never made any of the devices. I was there. Were, you there? Were either of you making up? I, I missed the Flynn. Fair enough. It was, it was fun. It was just happy to see, it was, you know, and we all miss shows. It's all, you know, it's just, it was fun to, there was a lot of energy in the room because it was fun to see them again. There was a lot of energy about event. that show too. I remember like when they announced that, I thought about driving up to seven, up to, up to Burlington to see it. And it was, you listen, and they had horns. So people who, you know, who wanted to get their, their horn tunes and the like, that was great. So they released this, but this only, you know, they, they send this out, right. It only took them through, uh, April 30th. And then we, we, we received the full on first ever, you know, full color Schweiss. And they add, they start picking up with the next week and three dates call out to me, right? Um, it's a weekend. It's May 6, 7, 8. It's initially, it's the Bayou City Theater in Houston. That would change. It's the bomb factory in mm. Dallas and the backyard in Austin. And for me, you know, the chance to go see fish at some place called the bomb factory and some place called the backyard. Mm. That was it. Good instincts. Um, the, the only complication, it was mother's day weekend. Huh. And so I had, a, I had to sell that to my mom. I'm like, you know, every day is mother's day. Or so I said, <laughs> and my mom's a lovely, a lovely, lovely person. And she was cool with it. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you know, in the Northeast, this was a time you could see fish in arenas. And so the idea that I could go back and see fish in some of these smaller venues, not exactly knowing what they were, was, was pretty incredible. And as it turned out, by the way, before we get to the seventh, just real quickly, this Bayou City Theater on the sixth in Houston, I think they didn't quite uh, have the advanced sales that they thought they were going to. So they moved it to a place called the Tower, um, which I think is incorrectly listed some places as the tower theater which is what it originated as but it was just the tower and mm. that is the last time in my my show going life and i used to um i used to tape shows for a period of time where i was able to put down my gear walk up ride the rail for the show uh -huh. and then walk back to my gear there were not a lot of people at that show on the sixth um, which is a fine show. I don't think it's super duper memorable, but but a, but a lovely enough night. Um, and then that brings us to uh, to the seven. So that's my wind up to the pitch, I guess, Tom. You know, okay. there was it, you know if you, if you could do it, and you know you, you had the opportunity given where what Fish was doing at the time and the venues they were playing. You know why the, why the heck not? Why the heck not? I, I, I assume it'll be my last time to see Fish in a in a small venue, um, and particularly. Again, bomb factory, bomb factory backyard. Come on now. Dean, this is, <laughs> Dean, this is perfect. Well, first of all, for, for people listening on audio, Dean actually has the Donnie Edge Feist and the, 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 the visual props but, uh, that you can see on YouTube. But, you know, Dean, this, uh, what you were just saying feeds exactly into to what I want to talk to you about. You know, for actual decades now, you and I have worked together uh, for, on jambands.com, Relics, and, you know, for many, many years. And we've always discussed our love and our affection for, for music venues in and of themselves. So I think that this show from 1994 had a mystique to me 
the moment that I saw it on that tour schedule that you just showed from the Schweiz, when I got that newsletter before the show took place, just the name alone, as you were getting it, the Bomb Factory, such a curious name for a music venue. And this was before the age of, you know, omnipresent internet, where you could just, with a few clips, see what it's all about. So my imagination, I think, probably made it into something that it's not. Can you describe what the venue was like? Sure. And by the way, this is, sure. I mean, this really, by the way, was still, you know, you and I were on Usenet. Like, there really weren't browsers where you could go out and have a game, take a gander at the venue. May, maybe in a few places, but certainly not widely available. Uh, you know what? At, at the end of the day, it was a bomb factory. I think, you know, I mean, because like you, right, we're both, we, we, we both enjoy venues. So I got down there a little early, tried to learn everything that I could about it. What was this going to be like? Of course, spent the day in Dealey Plaza, you know, because that's what one does when one's from the Northeast to see, you know, all the, the Kennedy parade route and the like. And then I, I, I had a, and then I saw a little bit of a baseball game because when you're on the road, you got to get out and do it. Saw a little bit at the ballpark. But I was at the venue early to ask about this. So I guess originally, it, uh, they made cars there at the turn of the 20th century, right around 1900, 1910. And then during World War II, they turned it into a bomb factory. And so you were in a venue that was one long room. It was, it was uh, wide, but, but narrow. So if you were all the way in the back, which is where I was, I was running, you know, I was recording the show, I was taping that night. You weren't, I couldn't unfortunately make my way to the front like I could the night before, but you weren't that far away from the band. But it wasn't dissimilar for people who maybe were at the old, I compare it almost to the old Lupo's on uh, Westminster Street, for people who remember that version of Lupo's, which uh, had once been a department store. And it was the same sort of idea where it wasn't, the back of it wasn't all that far away, but it was very, very, very wide. So, you know, it's just a big open space. I wish it were, you know, it were more charming than it actually was, but it was cool. It was fun to see them there. It, it, you know, it's always a delight to, to check out a new venue, to see fish in a new place. And, you know, at that time, I, I, fish was on fire, I thought, that tour, in part because they hadn't played really for all that long. They did the four shows, like I said, at year's end, but it had been, you know, uh, seven months or thereabouts. So it, ju it just all of that uh, seemed like the, to make, the, it was the ideal mix to make for a pretty cool night. That's cool. And you, you, you touched on uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier um, about being able to see fish in different mix of theaters and stuff. Um, but I remember spring 94 really only for, I believe one show. Technically I went to the last of the three beacon theater shows in New York city um, in April. And that was probably like 15 or 16 shows before this show that we're talking about tonight. But um, I did a, uh, uh, even though I miss Flynn theater, I was able to see the giant country horns there. And uh, there were five of them. I'd seen them before in a smaller number, I believe. Um, but Gears and Grippo and three others uh, whose names I actually don't know. Um, but uh, if you look at that tour, um, you can almost see the band grow like before your, your very eyes. It was a mix of theaters, auditoriums, arenas, college arenas, um, but also still a few, very few nightclubs. And, and before we get like into the nitty gritty of the actual tweezer fest, where was the band as a band this point in time? I think that's an interesting question. Can I just say one thing, by the way, to the, to the beacon run, which I think feeds into everything. Yeah. Please. If you remember the second night of the beacon run was the night where the audience started the Wilson chant. So I was there that night oh. and to be in the middle of that, to feel like, Oh gosh, this, this is something big. We all get this. We're here, not accidentally by, you know, not to just to check out whoever this might be on the stage. We're here to see fish. <laughs> it's, it's a Friday night um, in, in New York City. And, and to, to hear people chanting Wilson, you know, and it starts off slowly and then it, <laughs> it picks up real quick and everybody gets it. And it feels like that's really we're at the moment where. Fish fans out and up far outnumber just about anyone else in a room. And it's hard to, to, to imagine what it was like before that point. Like nowadays you go to see a fish show. Most everyone has some familiarity with fish. 
But 1994 in particular, you see that shift in the audience. And I think that has to impact the band as well. Getting that energy from, from the audience, everyone who's there to be there, to, to convene with, with the band and throw something back at the, at the stage. So I don't know that, 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 that the, the night before you were there, Tom, at, at the beacon really was, was, was meaningful to me because it did seem like something else was going on. Above and beyond that, right? This is just after Hoist. So right. Fish is breaking out that that new material. Again, they hadn't played, save for those four nights at the end of December. They hadn't played for a while. Mm-hmm. I think they were kind of bringing it all back together and thinking about what this meant for them and really starting to to stretch. And, you know, th- this uh, this April tour goes on for a while. Again, they, they did the four dates, and then they're really sort of developing things on the road, you know, defining, redefining their sound, connecting with, with the audience. It was, it's a pretty cool moment to, to, to be lucky enough, you know, to be there to, to head out with them. 100%. Uh, let's, uh, you guys, let's actually pause here for a moment. Um, actually, let's not pause at all, but in the spirit of the Tweezer Fest, let's just say we're doing a segue here, unpredictably, into a quick word from our sponsors. Uh, when we return, we'll be right back into Tweezer. Have you ever wondered what it would feel like if your investments reflected what matters most to you? At Green Future Wealth Management, the advisors specialize in helping clients manifest their values in their financial lives. Green Future Wealth Management was founded by certified financial planner practitioner and longtime fan Nick Cantrell, named by Forbes as one of the top next-gen wealth advisors in the country. Whether you are just getting started or have complex investing and financial planning needs, visit them on the web at greenfuturewealth.com. You can sign up for the email list or take the investing values quiz. When you feel ready, schedule a free virtual consultation. In appreciation for the amazing fish community and the incredible work being done by fans across the country, Green Future Wealth Management will be donating 10% of asset management proceeds from new Osiris listener clients to fans for racial equity. Just be sure to mention Osiris when booking your appointment. Create your green future. Securities offered through Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc. Cambridge and Green Future Wealth are not affiliated. We are back, as promised. The segue points us right back into the tweezer. You know, this was actually not the first time that the band chose to use Tweezer as a, as a jam vehicle. Uh, it was kind of born to be that. And it certainly wasn't, you know, the last time that the band ever said wait in and out. But in 1992, in 1993, there was even a show that Tom, you and I just talked about recently on here, um, 2-2093 at the Roxy. You know, the band makes it a jam sandwich. But what was it about this one that made it so unprecedented that immediately people started calling it the Tweezer Fest? You know what? I'm going to let Mike Gordon answer that question. Where is? Hold on. I have I have more. Uh, so to remind everybody, uh, you know, Mike released four shows right through um, uh, through the live fish series. Right. He, he got he picked four shows. He picked 17, 18, 19 and 20 for people who care. And if you uh, want to check them out and you're listening, you know, 17 is, is Portland Meadows, 98, 18 is the bomb factory. 19 is a, is a horn show. Um, 712, 91 on tour, 91, that, that, that tour. And then the last one in my home state of Rhode Island is, um, is 12, 29, 94 with the amazing Bowie. So, but in each of these, Mike, uh, offered up his notes on the night. So I'll, I'll give you my answer, but I'll give you, here's what Mike had to say though. Um, so it includes, and you'll, you'll, I'm, I'm reading for people who can't, you know, see me. I'm reading that it includes the the, the package includes Mike's little uh, diary, his journal notes from the night, and here's what he said: Dallas. Um, he describes it by the way, great gig. Um, Dallas. Before the second set, we did a shot of whiskey. We decided to jam the whole set. It was great. Underscore. Get a tape. Yeah, that's a, I, I like that. Uh, Mike reminding himself to get a tape. Started with Tweezer, all songs connected, song list abandoned, ended with Tweezer. Um, Trey set up a delay loop. Fish and I hit blams. Uh, I did good reggae bars playing, alternating with ambience. I mean, the thing is, 
It's not that they were going in and out of song, which they did up right at the Roxy in 93, like at the show you described. But here, they're just going off the rails. They're just, they're jamming. And wherever they find themselves, if they find themselves in a key that's going to take them into a song, they start doing it. They play some of, some of Cannonball, right? Um, that's just, you know, they play Sparks because that's just where they are. They do play Mind Left Body Jam for, you know, Grateful Dead fans. You know, and it def- that definitely what it is. I know there was a time people would debate it, but I think there's no question, if you know what you're listening for, that that is precisely what it is. So, you know, they eventually make their way into, into Purple Rain. So there's like, you know, there's, and there's a Fishman vacuum solo which which is which is which was great particularly in the venue at that you know at that moment in time because definitely people were scratching their heads as to, as to what was going on but i do think the difference between everything that had preceded and everything that followed is to them it just was a jam they finally were going out there not sweating it and saying okay we're just going to jam for this set and let's see where it gets us and that to my mind is when everything changed I, I will say this, aside from the band, for me personally, that's when everything changed. I, I did enjoy fish. I'd seen my fair share of fish before that point. But that was that was the time where, where I said to myself, wow, they're, they're going to they're going to do what I think they can do. Um, what I imagine they do in rehearsal, you know, what I've heard a little bit of in sound check, and they're going to do it in front of an audience. So let's see where this will take us. And that led me to, a, again, a fair number of, of fish shows over the years to come. Not that I hadn't seen them before then, but right. this was a progress over year two for people who know. I mean, uh, you know, the Grateful Dead, I enjoy a good old Grateful Dead. You know, we're starting to, to wind things down. I think I personally, I know there's other people like this. I think I'd seen like 30 dead shows the year before still 93, uh-huh. which you can debate the wisdom of that, but that's, it's Grateful Dead. And, and 94 was the year though, where I crossed over and began seeing more shows not that not that there were a lot of dead shows that, that still were you know to come but that was the year i made my commitment if if there was you know some sort of timing issue fish was it for me uh and the bomb factory is the night that really sealed the deal for me relative to that i i think you probably in that either you or mike answered the question i was going to ask which is basically we still talk about the bomb factory 28 years later and, you know, Fish has played thousands of great shows, but was this Tweezer Fest, because there's also so many great tweezers, was this some kind of milestone? Like they hadn't done anything like it before, or was it the song itself just a great fish jam? No, I, I do think that, I mean, listen, I think as you pointed out, I think Mike indicates it. They're trying something different that night. Now, listen, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're hunting for amazing tweezers, this one actually might not be your bag. It's, they don't go as far out there as some of the other ones that that would follow. I mean, I think about what happened in in, in you know in Bangor, Maine, in uh, right November, which is on a live one. And by the way, to frame that one for people who might not remember this, uh, they they that was the show right after Halloween. So they you know they they play that amazing three sets on Halloween. And they're focused on the music of the Beatles. And then they go up, then they have a night off. And then on the second, they go up to Bangor and they do this incredible, you know, tweezer that really sort of takes, in certain respects, the, um, the Bomb Factory one and brings it to a, no, a new level, even though it's not an entire set. But they, they just musically, they go much, much, much further out there. And, and you'll see additional ones like that over the, uh, over the summer of, of, of 95 as well, in particular. And then just to, to bring it all around just for the, the heck of it, uh, at the end of 95, uh, they play one in New Haven, 12 to 95, which is much, much shorter, but super duper tight and, and, and energetic. And that was the night I got to make the audience chess move. So I, on a good tape, if I'm listening to a tape, I can hear them introduce me. And then they play this kick-ass tweezer. So it's so it's so it's fun. <laughs> and it, it is a kick-ass tweezer. And as you mentioned, and as you, you got it, you know, there are, it, for tweezer aficionados, there are tweezers out there that might be more of, of if you want to go and listen to a tweezer, if you're in the mood for a tweezer. But this tweezer fest is a thing that is in and of it itself. That being said, you know, all anybody remembers the bomb factory for is the fact that it was the, the tweezer, you know, is the tweezer fest. It's outsized. It has the footprint that is literally the size of the entire second set. <laughs> 
But were there any other highlights of, of this night that you can remember or that people should listen to if they want to listen to the show? I mean, I think in retrospect, it, it's a charming, fun first set. You know, if you listen, it opens with with Loving Cup, which you know, who doesn't want to hear? Who doesn't want to hear Loving Cup? And just to remind people, too, because whenever I think of Loving Cup, I think of the show just about a year earlier uh, that opened uh, their their spring tour. It's February of 93 when uh, Paige first gets his baby grand. So they debut the song. It's the opening song, too, in the show at, at the Portland Expo. And, you know, to hear to hear Paige on Baby Grand on Loving Cup really just sort of elevates the, the song. And I remember when he had it that night, I remember thinking, is he going to tour with this or this is just a special thing? It's sort of close to where he lives. But sure enough, he would go out with it. So, you know, listen, to hear to hear Paige playing on that uh, a, a year later, that it was still as part of it, you know, part of the gear that they that they would tour with. That was fun. I, I think if you listen to uh, the horn which comes um, second, there's a weird, it's sort of brief, but there's a weird little jam that's somewhat atypical at the end of that. Um, I like Fast Enough for You, which I think, which I find to be sometimes sort of s subtly psychedelic in certain ways, uh -huh. which I think people don't give it credit for, to my mind. Aside from, you know, credit Tom, for the, the, the cognitive dissonance between the, uh, the lyrics and the music itself is always pretty, pretty awesome. But, but, but I do think um, that 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 song really can be kind of heavy and sort of heady, too, depending on when when, when you when you hear it. Um, you know, there's a scent of a mule pretty early in that song's career again, because they just they just busted that out that, you know, that uh, with with the hoist album. So, you know, what? there's a split open a melt that's that's pretty good i remember by the way being there and the split open the melt was one of the tests of how many people here actually know fish because when they start you can you can you can tell if people get it and there were like a, there was like a smattering of applause i'm like okay so we're in the room this is before the teaser we're in a room where people some people know fish but it definitely is is new terrain for for a lot of people um and Susie closes the first set. It, it's it's a perfectly fine set. There's nothing wrong with it. People want to throw it on. You get an hour of music. I think you'd enjoy during a you know during a, a good period of the band's career. But but truthfully, you know, it, it's certainly not momentous. In '94, you can say that it's a good it's a good show, kind of about every single show. Well, I, I, I don't, as I listen back, I'm, I'm sort of feeling that way. Um, once we're inside the tweezer and let's go there because we've been dancing around it. Um, the jam includes in and outs of so many different, like mind left body jam sparks, Mackie super policeman walk away and the digital delay t uh, loop jam and uh, sweet emotion and cannonball and purple rain. And just listing those, um, <laughs> feels like a, a whole mouthful um, and mindful, headful. Do you remember if there was a point where you realized this is just going to be one big tweezer or, uh, you know, was the reaction like, holy shit, or was it more like, what the F is going on? So for me, if you're listening, if you happen to be listening, to this, it's like, it's a sweet emotion jam. That, that's when I realized that it, at first, I'm not sure it could just be, I mean, it, it was obvious right away, by the way, pretty soon into it through mind left body jam, through Sparks, maybe, and Makasupa. But this was something pretty incredible. By the time, and then the, the Sweet Emotion Jam comes after the after the, the digital delay loop. And that's when I realized, I think this is going to be the whole set. <laughs> um, but, but that was, and there's still more to come, by the way, after that. You know, there's Walkaway, there's Cannonball, yeah. uh, there's Purple Rain. But but I think that, that's the moment where I thought, oh gosh, this is what they're doing. And by the way, because I imagine this is something you're thinking of too, that, that's when I wondered, what do other people think about this? So I started walking around. A little, I had my, my gear in the back. Like I said, I was taping the show, but I started walking around just for a sense of, of what people thought. And I would say there were plenty of people who, you know, whose mouths were just like a gape, like just, just, you know, what, you know, were <laughs> not, I don't know if they were totally, totally into it, like on with every note, but certainly they were almost like, in, in a trance like what is this band 
doing? And I think for the most part, they were thinking that in the best way possible. But plenty of them, I thought, were sort of addled and confused. And by the way, there was a lot of room in that venue. The room, the venue was not was not was not full. Um, wow, my other that, that memory, by the way, ar- around that time is um, because there was so much room. Uh, you know, Waldo, it was who would be out, you know, would be out, Sean, who would be out on tour selling his gear. He was there that night. And I remember I just had so much energy. This is right around the probably right after the Sweet Emotion Jam that I see him in the back. I, I had a beverage in my hand, just a cup. And I just chucked the, I chucked the empty cup at him um, just because I was just like, I had like so much going on. Picked it up, by the way, for the record. But just <laughs> like I had, I, you know, I was just so super excited. The other person, by the way, who was there of a, a fish. Uh, fandom fame is david steinberg you know uh zizix the timer but at that point he be tended to be towards the front so i saw him briefly <laughs> during set break but i really wanted to commune with someone who had some sense of, of what was going on there were a couple tapers there but they weren't like fish tapers that i knew from the road so i knew waldo and i knew and i knew and i knew zizix so uh one of them i tried to cop at the other one i couldn't I, I couldn't find actually until the end of the show but there was a lot of i thought pent up energy at least on my part uh you know in the room as this was you know as this was going on Dean, uh, we are sadly running out of time but first there's a there's a, a question that i have to ask you cuz uh on undermine this season we're we're kind of making our way to fall 97 with the 25 shows that get us there. And obviously this is one of them. And in my opinion, this is a big one. It's a legendary show in and, of, in and of itself, of course, but but how did this get Fish one step closer to where they landed in 1997? Well, you know, if you think about the um, the Denver tweezer, right? The, Mc, the McNichols show, they opened the first set with a pretty big tweezer. I think that's somewhat reminiscent of this. It's not, you know, they, they've evolved a lot since this point, but I think you can hear a little bit of, of this one in, in that one. There's a pretty big tweezer at the palace uh, at Auburn Hill, right? 12, six, 97, same idea. I, I think, so I think number one, specifically you can hear it in where tweezer, how tweezer evolved over time. I, I also think you can hear it in just how bold fish became. They went into a room or most people didn't really know who they were or what they were doing. And basically they just blasted a jam for an entire set because it felt good to them with the hope that they would then connect with people in the room. And I think for the most part, they did. I said people were standing there with their, their mouths open, but they didn't leave. You know, they, they hung <laughs> out. They wanted to figure out what was going on. Who <laughs> is this band? What are they doing? And all of those things, I think, uh, it took place in the in the best way possible, to my mind. <laughs> That's that's amazing. Well, we might be undermined, but we are definitely over time. Um, but we want to thank our uh, special guest today, Dean Budnick. And thanks, as always, to my co-host, Benji Eisen, and our fellow executive producers, RJB and Matt Dwyer. And thank you, of course, to everyone out there in podcast land for joining us. And if you like us, come back for more. And if you don't, you didn't make it this far anyway. But for everyone else, please give us a review and subscribe wherever you listen or watch. And we also love direct feedback. You can find us on Twitter at Undermine Pod. And we will see you next week. And until then, if you get a chance, here's a hint. Listen to 62294. And don't do anything Benji wouldn't do. Thank you so much, Dean, for being our guest today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you, uh, Benji, for co-hosting. Thanks, Tom, and thanks, Dean. Osiris.